By now you're wondering why it's a casual Sunday and I'm dressed like this and it's because um, I had a prop. And so while may, many of you have probably never stepped inside of a boxing ring, right? Uh, you've never worn some of these. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I couldn't come out with like, you know, like a pair of like nice slacks and a dress jacket or something. So I just used the excuse to have casual Sunday because some of people after first service like, oh man, casual Sunday, pastor, ooh, ooh. And I'm like, well, you know what? I see how you're dressed, so hey. No, I, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. Hey, we're talking about taming the tongue today. No, uh, 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 no, but... <laughs> I didn't plan for any of that. I apologize. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, we have probably, most of us have never really worn a pair of boxing gloves. You've never put some of these on. Uh, and you've never really tried to knock somebody out in a ring. But isn't it true that all of us, we've been in matches where we've used our words to throw punches. And the sad reality is that those who take some of our best punches, our harshest words, are those that we say we love the most. Words matter. Words are powerful. Words, I think you would agree with me, pack a punch, don't they? See, all of us have been deeply hurt or greatly helped by words. And while words can be forgiven, oftentimes words are not forgotten. They leave a mark. There's a wound. There's pain. Why? Because words have weight. And today we're beginning a brand new series called Taming the Tongue. This is our third sub-series as we've been making our way through a study of the New Testament book of James. And by the way, if you're new with us, I want to welcome you here to Pathways Church to our online church family. Can we give it up for our online church family, those who are joining us? Your brothers and sisters are clapping for you because they love you. And you know what? If you are in driving distance 15 or 20 minutes away, I just want to encourage you. Listen, online is a great opportunity. It's an option. But, you know, my personal thing is I, I just think there's a greater and a deeper experience when you're with faith family in the room. And so if you can make it, listen, make it. And I get it. We're back to school and kids are like, oh, you know, we haven't been there for a while. It's okay. They'll adjust. Being a part of your church family in person in the room, I think is really helpful and it's healthy for your spiritual development and growth. Online, uh, in my view, it should be an option. Um, it should be an opportunity, but I think it's more of the exception than the norm, unless you're states away. And I know we have friends who watch in Missouri and Pennsylvania and other parts, uh, Florida and Ohio, and I'm so grateful that you're tuning in. But uh, for some of us, I think uh, we live in this area. We're a part of our church family. Let's do everything we can be to, do, uh, to be a part of what's happening here. If you're a guest today, thank you so much for checking out Pathways Church. We have something coming up in the next couple of weeks called Newish. Love for you to be a part of that. And if you're inviting people, We'll make sure you invite them because this is a great opportunity. There's cards in the lobby. You can make an invitation. And uh, there are new friends that are coming back and wanting to be a part of what God is doing here at Pathways. So for the past nine weeks, if you're new, we've been working uh, through the book of James. And you can go uh, at YouTube, or you can go and download our mobile app, catch up on some of that content, which by the way, if you uh, go to our app under this weekend, click on message notes, you can find all the scriptures and some of the application points that I'm talking about today. And our goal is to do everything we can to get the content of God's word into your hands. And in turn, God can take his word and place it into your heart so that he can change your life as you cooperate with him. And isn't that what we all want, amen? Amen. Amen? Good. So, why do words have such a deep impact on our lives? I mean, if you think about it, words can trigger us. Words, they can comfort us. How many of you heard a song recently, maybe on your playlist, and it was from high school, and it immediately took you back to a certain memory, right? Words just, yeah, they bring you back. Words are powerful. Words can hurt us. Think of maybe a rough relationship in your past, or maybe today you're in a relationship right now, and words, they're really hard for you to hear, to endure. Words create emotion. They make us feel a certain way. Why is that? 
Well, words have weight. Words have weight. There's something inherently different about words and our expression of those words. And that's why we're talking about taming the tongue because James has a lot to say as we mature in faith. Chapter one, he talked about trials and temptations. A mark of maturity in chapter two was what what, what do we do when we suffer? What do we do when we engage in God's word? We read the word. How, How do we grow in the midst of this? Well, in chapter three, he takes another practical application of our faith and he talks about our mouths. He talks about our words. So why are words weighty? Why are they heavy? Well, let me give you just three simple but profound reasons as according to God's word why words have weight. First off, God uses words to create. Words have weight because words create. In Genesis chapter one, there's one phrase that's used 10 times in the very first chapter of the Bible. That phrase is this, and God said, let there be. And God said, oh, you read it before. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God said, let there be sky. And there was, God said, let there be Land, water, all of these things, and all of those things appeared. God used words to create our world, and not just our world, but as we sang earlier in worship, a million galaxies were created at the word of God. Everything came into existence. A hundred billion galaxies are born. Did you see on the LED screens, you saw the beautiful imagery of the mountains. Like all, like when we, when we go outside and we enjoy creation, it reminds us, it's a reflection of God's presence. Why? Because it's his words that created the beautiful tapestry and the images, the sunrises and the sunsets and, and all of the beauty that we see seasonally. How many of you have been taking drives and have you noticed if you're in certain parts of Northeast Wisconsin, the leaves are just starting to change. Fall is in the air, right? That's God's creation. Words have power. That's why Psalm 19, 1 and, 1 and 2 says that his, his creation pours forth speech. It speaks to us. So the first reason that words have weight is because God uses words to create. The second reason is that God reveals himself through his words. You say, how does that happen, Adam? Well, if you go back to Genesis chapter 1 and 2, God creates humanity. Adam and Eve, he speaks them, he creates them in his image. You were created in the image of God. Words have weight because God reveals himself through you and me. And guess what? He gives us the verbal expression, the the power to be able to communicate, to praise him, to worship him, as well as to communicate our thoughts and our feelings and our expressions, our emotions to one another. So one of the reasons in October, we're going to have a worship night on October 17th. This place should be packed You know why? Because this is an opportunity for us to say, as much as you have created a billion galaxies, God, God, because the creation still obeys you, the sun comes up, it goes down, the leaves change color, there's beauty and there's symmetry in creation. You know what? So will I. I will worship you. I will come and lift up your name. So make sure you check that out. Well, the last reason that words have weight, this is a simple but profound reason. Words have weight because God gives direction through his words called commandments. This is what he said to Adam and Eve when he created our world, all the galaxies, and he put in the middle a garden, a garden called Eden, and God provided Adam and Eve with the very first command. This is what it says in Genesis chapter 2. And the Lord commanded, man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. But you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. What's the clear command? Eat of any tree, but not this one, because if you eat of this one, here's what's going to happen. You will certainly die. And just like God gave Adam and Eve direction, he gives us direction through his commands. And here's the simple spiritual principle. When we obey, good things happen. When we disobey, bad things happen. Sway it is. 
I can dress it up. I can say, hey, listen, when you, obedience brings blessing and disobedience brings pain and chaos. But, but the simple spiritual principle is like, God's not going to be mocked. You can't outdo God. You can't, you, can't, you can't go against his direction and his commands and expect good things to happen in your life. And you know what? That's not God's fault. That's yours. You didn't listen to the direction and the clear commands that God put out in his word. Now, here's the thing. Not only does God speak, but you know who else speaks? We learn it from the first uh, three chapters of the Bible. We learn that Satan speaks. Our spiritual enemy, the devil speaks. And his words, what are they? They're cunning. They're deceptive, and they're also powerful. Why? Because they want to contradict, and they want to distort, and they want to twist God's commands, his direction. He did it with Adam and Eve, and Satan does it with you and me today. So we need to be intentional about how we use our words not to throw punches in order to hurt somebody, whether it's intentionally or unintentionally. We need to tame our tongue. Which brings us to James chapter 3. If you have a Bible, go with me there to James chapter 3 or mobile device. You can click that, turn that on. And James is a New Testament book. Actually, scholars believe it's one of the first books that made it into the canon about 40 AD. So roughly seven years after the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus Christ, the half-brother of Jesus, James, he writes a letter. And this letter is very powerful. In the letter, it contains a very instructional word about our tongues. Now, as you get to James chapter 3, I need to make a confession, okay? Here's my confession. If there was one verse that I did not want to share with you when it came through the study of the book of James, it was this next verse that I'm going to read to you. And I didn't want to share this verse with you because this verse is, uh, it's a heavy verse, Uh, In fact, truth be told, I wanted to skip over this verse. In fact, I knew this section was coming up of the scripture, and I thought to myself, you know, I can go to verses 3, 4, and 5, which I'll teach on next week. Next week, you won't want to miss, because I'm going to talk about how you lessen the amount of hurtful words that come out of your mouth. That'll be a good teaching. And I thought, you know what, God, I'll go there. There's some great illustrations. I can bring props out, and da-da-da-da-da. And have you ever like realized that there's something inside of your heart and you're like, man, I don't want to go there. I don't want to go there. And God's like, yeah, you kind of have to go there. It can be like uh, personally, it could be in your walk, in your relationship and confessing to him. I don't know. You, but you know what I'm talking about, right? You know what I'm talking about? Okay. Well, this verse, I didn't want to go there. So let me read the verse to you and I'll explain why. Ready? Here it is. James 3.1. Verse says this, James 3, 1, he writes, he says, not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. James says that those who are teachers of God's word, individuals who interpret and attempt to apply God's words, they will be judged more strictly. This is a sobering truth. It's a sobering truth that for 23 years of my life, I've lived with. As a middle school and high school youth pastor, as a high school and young adults pastor, as a campus pastor, and now for the last 11 years as the lead pastor here, your pastor, your friend, this is a sobering truth. It means that every word, every thought, every emotion, every concept that I've tried to articulate to you in order to communicate about our God, his love, his forgiveness, his mercy, I will be held accountable. And it's not just my words. It's my actions. My entire life as the teacher of the Bible is held to a higher level of accountability. That's what James says. James 3.1, in the language of our culture, would read this way. We expect more from our leaders. True? Our leaders are held to a higher level. Standard. Another reason why I wanted to avoid reading this verse to you is because, quite frankly, it's embarrassing. If you've been with us here, a part of our church family for the last several years, then you know that my actions did not align with the words in every area of my life. 
If you're new, you're thinking to yourself, what are you talking about? Well, you can go to pathwayschurch.us forward slash updates. For those of you who've been with us, though, you know that my actions, my words were misaligned, and I created a lot of pain in my marriage for our daughters, my girls, for our church family, and for the watching community here in the Fox Valley and those of you who are online. And I paid a price. I paid a price. But God, because of his great mercy and his forgiveness, he's not done with me yet. And I can tell you this, I have sought forgiveness. I've done the work. I've made the men's. I have put in the reps. Listen, I am doing the work to heal and I am at peace with my past. My past will not serve as a prison cell. My past will be a learning lab in order for the glory of God to be expressed through the full work of my life until the day I die. And... And here's the best part. The same is true for you. Just because I stand on a stage and I've gone through the hell that I've gone through doesn't mean that you haven't gone through hell too. And you know what? God sent Jesus to rescue you from hell. Amen. So, so don't allow your past to be your prison. Let it be a place, a source of learning, grow in humility, and continue to move forward. You don't have to remain locked up. You can get help through Jesus. You can get help through our church family. We want to support you. We want to lead you into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Now, this verse isn't just about me. Guess what? It's about you, too. You should be clapping. No. (laughs) You're like, really, Adam? I thought it was about you. It said teachers of the Bible. I'm like, what's up with that? Well, let me show you how it works. Ready? James, when he wrote the letter, I think it was two weeks ago, I said to you, it's important to know the recipients of a letter, right? Who wrote it and then who uh, received the letter. James was not at a pastoral conference. He wasn't at Moody Bible and he didn't say, hey, all the pastors come into town because I need to write, uh, I I got some things to say. That's not who, no, 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 no. The context of James uh, was written to a group of believers, scattered, right? And he's writing primarily to a Jewish audience and he says uh, in James 3, 1, hey, listen, none of you don't don't kind of step up in the assembly or in the synagogue or as you're scattered wanting to be teachers because remember, you're going to be judged more strictly. And now here's what James is doing. James is also picking up on Jesus's words and he's saying essentially this, I want to remind you that all of you are teachers. And you're saying, wait a second, Adam. Hmm, I don't know about that. Not sure. I'm not serving in Pathways Kids. I'm not a teacher at Fox Valley Lutheran. I'm not a teacher in public school. I, I, what are you talking about? I'm not a teacher. That's not my profession. That's not my calling. I'm not gifted. I'm not passionate about that. Listen, I'm not a teacher. But James has been hitting on this theme of language and teaching, and, and he's saying that all of us have a responsibility to teach. Now, before I show you that from the text, let me show you where James has been. He talks about the tongue, this reoccurring theme in James chapter one, verse 13. He says, when tempted, no one should say, here's the line, God is tempting me. God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. What James is saying is that our temptation begins with our misdirected desires, not with his perfect direction. Drop down in verse 19. This is what James says. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Every time you engage with God's word, with the scriptures, Listen, make sure that you should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. He goes on to say this about taming the tongue. This is a very, very, very powerful verse. Man, convicting. Verse 26, those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves. And the religion is, James says, is worthless. 
James places a high standard on all of us as believers when it comes to our words. And if you stop and you think about it, Jesus, James's half-brother, said the very same thing. Post-resurrection, prior to Jesus being ascended into heaven to be at the right hand of the Father, he said, I want you to go and wait in Jerusalem and pray. And before he did that, he gave to all his believers a mission, a mandate. It's called the Great Commission. And this is what he says. Let me explain to you why all of us are teachers at some point. Jesus, his words, Matthew 28, 19, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Isn't it true that every time someone learns that you are a Christian, every time they see ink on your arm or something on the back of your car or some way faith comes up or you say something, they see a cross around your neck. Anytime you put something on a on an X handle or Instagram, there's a verse, something comes up and all of a sudden people know that you you have faith, that you follow Jesus. Isn't it true that there's this unspoken reality that you are held to a higher standard? The stakes go up, don't they? Yeah, but it's not fair that people expect more from me as a Christian, Pastor Adam. I know what you mean. Yeah, but Adam, I'm so human. I know. Me too. So am I. The thing is, we're all human, aren't we? And there's always a gap in our lifestyle, we're broken, we're messy. Regardless of how much you know and how, there's always temptation for failure and fault and sin in our lives. That's why we're all in need of grace. And it's one of the reasons I believe that the Fox Valley needs churches, brothers and sisters like you and me that are quick to offer mercy and grace and slow to offer judgment and critique. And yet, whether you like it or not, or whether I like it or not, the moment you step up and say, I'm a Christian, I'm a pastor, I'm a leader, whatever it is, listen, the brutal reality is that your words, my words, our actions are examined more thoroughly. And there is a tension that we're called to manage here. I don't think there's a problem that needs to be solved. It's a tension that we need to acknowledge, need to be aware of, and we need to manage it through the power of the Holy Spirit by managing our mouths and our actions. We can only do this, friends, with God's help. But James tells us straight up that there's a tension. That's why he follows up in verse two and he says this. He says, we all stumble in how many ways? We all stumble in how many ways? Many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect. The Greek word right there is teleos. It means, it means mature. It means complete, not lacking anything. James knows we're not perfect. That's why he says we stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. James's point is essentially this. None of us can keep our bodies in check. We're going to learn about that next week. The tongue is, it's, it's, man, it's like a crazy wildfire. James says, we're going to stumble. You see the tension? The tension is this. We're called to live into a higher standard, but the reality is we're broken. We're fallen. We're, 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 we're frail. We're going to mess up. We're not perfect. So what's James, what's his point? Well, James is telling us in this opening message of taming the tongue, here's what James wants to get to across to us as believers, as teachers, as leaders, all of us. James is telling us that no part of you and me is more slippery, is more susceptible to sinning than our tongue. 
This small part right here. I was reading one commentator and they said, no wonder why God gives us teeth and a mouth to cage that little tongue. I thought, man, yeah, that's kind of true. Friends, it's only by the grace of God that we can manage our mouth in a way that doesn't disqualify our character and reputation as believers. So let's talk application very quickly. What's the most obvious point of the message? Watch your words. Watch our words. We got to watch our words, right? Think before we speak. Give careful consideration to what we say before we say it. Because it's really hard to put words back into our mouths or take them back from the people that we've hurt around us. If you're a parent today, listen, here's what you can do. Tonight, when your kids are getting ready because school has started and kids are going back and, you know, it's week two of school, right? And so you want to get them ready. By the way, if you didn't know school started, parents, school started. You can send them off to school. Okay, good. All right. See, we do some really helpful things here at Pathways Church. Remind you, school. All right? So here's what you can do. You say, hey, buddy, what did you learn about in church today? I don't remember, mom. That was a long time ago. You could say, hey, here's what we learned about. We learned about words. And then they're brushing their teeth, right? Take the whole thing. This will be memorable. Trust me. Take the whole thing of toothpaste, get a piece of toilet paper out, and squeeze it all out. Your kids will be like, what are you doing? We don't need that much. You say, buddy, This is what words are like. When you say them, it's really hard to put them back in your mouth, just like it's really hard to get that toothpaste back in the tube. Be careful of what you say. That's why we want to honor each other in our family. That's why we want to say loving and kind words. Tomorrow at school, your words matter, buddy. Because when you say something hurtful, you can't take it back and put it into your mouth. Pretty good, huh? I found it on YouTube. (laughs) No, let's get a little bit more serious. In less than 60 days, we're going to have a new president of the United States. This Tuesday is the first public debate. Very few issues start more verbal boxing matches than politics today. So a couple things to consider when it comes to your words during this election season. I'm going to give you six things real quick. Ready? Take notes. Here they are. Number one, be careful and considerate about what you say, post, tweet, or text. Seems obvious, but we as Christians sometimes miss this. Here's a question that you can ask yourself before you post it, tweet it, text it, talk about it at work. Here's the question. Is what I'm about to say going to bear good fruit? Or is it going to cause problems? If it's not going to bear good fruit, if it's not in alignment with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, according to Galatians 5, 22, and 23, and 24, then I would suggest that you refrain from saying it. Here's the second thing when it comes to the election season. Be passionate. Be passionate about your position. I'm not saying don't be passionate. Be passionate. It's okay. But what's not okay is to be unloving or demeaning toward others who don't hold to your position. Number three, and I've learned this as I get older. Proverbs 19.2 says, zeal without knowledge is not a good thing. I used to be real zealous about a lot of things in life. But as I have aged, I am learning that the further away you are from a problem, the easier the solution appears to be. So when it comes to our politics, let's take the approach. What if we took the approach to listen, to be humble and kind, to seek to understand before we're understood, Stephen Covey? Like, take that approach. And since I'm on the subject of politics, let me give you three more things. I told you six. Here's number four. It's not my place to tell you who to vote for. The pulpit and the platform in God's house is not meant to be used as a political measure to tell you how or to who to vote for you. That's why I'm never gonna name a a politician to vote for this person, okay? Now, while the who is not for this stage and platform and my convictions and how I understand scripture, how, on the other hand, I am called to, and I do feel the liberty to help you 
on the how to vote. You say, Adam, okay, so how should I vote? Well, I believe that my encouragement is to filter your vote through the wisdom of God's word. Okay? So, number six. So, here's how you vote. You understand your candidates at a local, state, federal level. You understand their positions, their platforms. Listen, this isn't a popularity contest, friends. Okay? This isn't who looks best on Instagram or whatever commercials they put in. No, 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 no. What do they actually believe? What do they support? Understand that. Then you filter that through what does God say? What does he value? What does he support? And you do your best to find a candidate that's compatible with the values and the truth of God's word. That's how you vote. Your vote is important. It's your voice. We need to elect officials that do what? That lessen evil and exalt our nation through righteousness. That's why Proverbs 14.34 says this, righteousness. What exalts the nation? Righteousness. But it exalts the nation, but sin condemns any people. That includes you and me. So we have to elect officials who choose righteousness over evil and work to lessen evil in our nation. And we do that by understanding his word, God's word, and we understand the candidates that are up for election. And speaking of our nation, can we pause in the middle of this message and can we pray for our nation during this election season? And can we also pray that God would lessen evil? Kids started school, I was saying in a joking way, but this past week, my heart is heavy. Evil. Georgia, Maryland. I was thinking about it this week. I never went to school and the teachers never talked to me about a shooter coming in. When I was at Herbert Hoover Elementary, when I was at Sarah Lindemuth, grade school, and I think about kids today. Listen, I'm praying for you teachers, you educators, public, private, homeschoolers. Listen, what you're doing in investing our kids, it's making a difference. We love you here at Pathways Church. If you're an educator, we honor you, we celebrate you, and we're praying for the safety and the protection of your classrooms. Amen? So would you bow your heads and your hearts with me and let's pray for our nation. Heavenly Father, we come to you. Lord, this is really hard. First week of school to see the evil, death. Oh God, we do trust and put faith in your word that you say when we turn our hearts to you, you heal our land. God, we turn our hearts, we repent, we're sorry. Forgive us, help us as Christians to live into a higher standard. God, I lift up every administrator, every school, paraprofessional teacher across all of the Fox Valley in our nation. God, I pray for your protective uh, strength and power to be on display. God, I pray in the name of Jesus, we won't have another school shooting this year. I ask you for it in Jesus' name. And everyone who agreed this first said, Amen. amen. Okay, so watch your words when it comes to this election season. A couple more things. What do you do when you hurt somebody with your words? Pretty obvious, but you know what you do? We apologize, we seek forgiveness, and we humble ourselves. We say, I'm sorry, I messed up, I was wrong. Those words right there, they weren't good. Your words have restorative power. You can repair a relationship. So make sure you humble yourself and you say, you know what? Hey, I'm sorry, I was wrong there. And James says we're going to fail in many ways. So when your mouth gets out of control, make sure you humble yourself and you take the approach to say, I apologize, I'm sorry. Now, what about the inverse? What if somebody says something to you hurtful? Whether it's intentional or not, you can instantly feel it in your body, can't you? Somebody fires off something at you, you can feel it. A student says something to you, a spouse, whatever it is, boyfriend, girlfriend, and somebody says something that, and you can feel it. No wonder why it's called a gut punch. What do you do? Well, you gather yourself, you watch your words, you don't strike back, you reflect for a moment, and then you make the decision to forgive. You forgive that person of the hurtful words that they said to you. Now, I know what you're thinking, but Adam... I don't feel like forgiving. Well, forgiveness isn't a feeling. Because if you felt like forgiving, you would never forgive. Forgiveness begins with a choice, and it's a process to feel 
that you have forgiven an individual. What do you mean by that, Adam? Well, it's a choice that's rooted in God's choice to forgive you. Because of his choice to forgive you, you now can access that by faith and say, I'm going to choose to forgive that individual. You say, okay, Adam, how many times do I have to make that choice? A lot. You have to forgive a person, make a choice over and over until it's over. Over and over until your feelings catch up to your decision. And I know we're all into feelings because we like the feels, right? So we want to know, like, is this over? Have I truly forgiven them? How do I know if I've forgiven them? You know you've forgiven them. You know you have forgiven them when you stop rehearsing the pain and the problem and the words that they have spoken to you. That's when you know you've forgiven them. But it begins with a choice. It starts with a, cho a choice, and the feelings will follow. So, it's a choice. It results in feelings. You've released them. Those words, that relationship, you can make a decision at that point. Do I continue to re-engage in that relationship or do I have to set an appropriate boundary? Sometimes we as Christians, listen to me, listen to me. Sometimes we think it's, it's strength to hold on to relationship. That makes us strong. We're doing the right thing. Sometimes it's strength to let go. If there is constant wounding and hurting and, and there's a lack of true repentance and renunciation and turning from that language, turning from those wounds, if it's abusive, abrasive, if it's continual, listen, you've tried to set boundaries, you've tried to do the work, and they just continue to repeatedly offend you, listen, you might have to give yourself some space. That's why we have a boundaries class coming up. Talk to somebody out of Connect. You can sign up to manage some of those areas of your life. Now, as we close, I want to briefly talk about this idea of forgiveness as both a choice and a feeling. I didn't read any commentators on this. Uh, I, I, I have no uh, church fathers, none of the patristics, Tertullian, uh, 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 Augustine. I, I, I don't know anybody who really talks about this. So give me a little liberty here. This is just my thought. My experience in reading God's word, I thought about this, this week. I'm not saying it is. I'm wondering out loud. I wonder if we see this idea on the cross. I wonder if we can forgive and that our words have way to either release and restore or set a boundary and move away in the context of forgiving because what we see Jesus do on the cross is simply this. How many of you know that Jesus was on the cross for six hours? And one of the very first things that he said on the cross was simply this, Father, forgive them, for, I, for they know not what they... Yeah. That was a choice right there. I think he had a choice. You can say, well, he's Jesus. He was going to choose to do that. Well, he was fully human. Because if you remember in the garden, he said, God, if it's possible, can you let this cup pass from me? In other words, I don't want to do this. I'm not looking forward to this. I know it's the plan, mission, purpose of my life, but... Whew. So he's on the cross and he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Six hours later, after a couple different sayings, he gets to the place and this is what he says in John 19, 30. He says this, it is finished. Whew. And then he gives up his spirit. Nobody took his spirit away from him, by the way. He's still fully divine. He gave it up because he wanted to give it up because he knew our forgiveness was bought on the cross and he knew things were paid for and he knew we were forgiven and he knew we were going to be in right relationship with God through him and his sacrifice. He did it for you and me. And his forgiveness was both a decision and the feelings caught up when he said, it is finished. And do you know what happened when he said it is finished? Do you know what happened? If you're new to the Bible, this is one of the coolest things in the New Testament. When he said it is finished, it literally, there's a veil in the Jewish temple. And it was a veil that was ripped from top to bottom. Why is that important? Because no human being took it and ripped it from top to bottom. It was too high. They would have ripped it from bottom to top, but the writer said it happened such that it was ripped from top to bottom because God was communicating a message that now my holy of holies, my very presence is open to all humanity. 
The Jewish temple was there for those who would just worship one time a year in the Holy of Holies. The priest would make atonement. But when Jesus died on the cross and he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do and it is finished, it was as our heavenly father was saying to all humanity, I'm gonna let you into my very throne room and presence. You can have full access to me because of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for you. When the veil ripped, when he said it is finished, it was to secure your salvation and your very entrance into the presence of almighty God. You don't need to work for it. You don't need to try harder. You don't need to do behavior modification. All you got to do is receive it. And when you receive it, then the work of the Spirit begins to change you from the inside out. And he does behavior modification with you as you cooperate with him. Did you catch that? That's why James says, faith without works is dead. It's a progression of growth and health, and change as you cooperate with him. So, what's your next move? That's what we're going to pray about. Would you bow with me? Heavenly Father, I know that you're speaking to some individuals today, and perhaps for some of our congregation, our church family, you're saying to them, hey, you got to watch your words. Your mouth is getting out of control. There's probably some parents, the stress and the schedules and everything that is mounting with back to school. And so, God, you're speaking. You want them to be kind, loving, patient with their kids, relationships. God, for others, you're asking them to go and seek forgiveness to make some things right because they've said some things that are hurtful. And then, Father, I believe that you're speaking to some and you're saying to them that, God, in this moment, they need to accept you as their personal Lord and Savior. They need to access your presence through your grace and your work on the cross. You know, the Bible says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, here's the promise. I'm speaking to some of you who are online today. Some of you are in a room and you're doubting whether God could love you, God could save you. The Bible says when you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, here's the promise of scripture, you will be saved. You will be saved. If you're here today and you want to make that decision, that profession of faith and say, yeah, I, I need Jesus in my life. I'm sorry, I was wrong, I repent. I need a savior. I can't do it on my own. If that's you today, would you just raise your hand all across this room? I just want to acknowledge that, and we're going to pray together as a church family. If you're here today and you want to make that decision, yes, thank you. Who else today wants to make that decision? Yes, thank you. Who else today? If you're online, thank you all the way over to my right, your left. If you're online, you can email info at pathwayschurch.us. We want to make sure that we follow up with you. We care for you. We're not dropping you off at the cross. We're leading you from the cross to a new destiny and hope and purpose. You were made for more, but it begins with this decision right here. Anybody else? Okay, as a church family, we pray out loud together. Would you pray with me? One full, strong voice. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for dying for me. It was your son who paid the price for my sin. So I repent. I return to you into your presence. Lead me, guide me, show me. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Can we celebrate that together today? Praise God for that. Praise God for that. Praise God for that.